the conditions under which we were transported. So, there were cargo cars. There were two vertical rows of wooden benches. And we were lying down on them. In our car, there were 20-something people, maybe 24. Mothers with small children, even one newborn, my classmates and colleagues from high school. So it wasn't that sad, but it wasn't particularly fun either. Naturally, there was trouble with personal hygiene. There was a cut-out hole in the floor in the corner. It was our restroom. So the ladies, which meant my mother and the rest of the women, made a curtain out of sheets and blankets, which kept the person from being visible. But I don't know. One stopped paying attention became numb to all those difficulties. The journey took two weeks. One time the train stopped. Through small windows in our car we saw people standing in a very long line. We asked, what are they waiting for? And somebody answered, for bread. Suddenly a cart with loose boards appeared, which was used to transport food, and potatoes fell out from inside of it. People standing in the line rushed to pick them up. It was shocking for us. This sight was shocking. What would it be like for us in this new paradise, this Soviet paradise? At night, we passed by the Ural Mountains. In the morning, I looked out of the window. The train was moving very slowly. I saw huge stones next to the train tracks. Names were engraved on them. Some of them were Polish. They were the names of the people who had built the railroad the people who had been deported to Siberia a long time ago. It was very emotional for us to see Polish names on the stones. We passed the Ural and got to Chelyabinsk. And in Chelyabinsk, it was Siberia now. They took us maybe 125 miles, maybe 200 miles. To a cooperative farm called Katunski, because it was close to the river Katun, which along with the river Bia flows into the river Ob. That region was called Old Barda. This cooperative farm had breeding cows, and they milked the cows and brought the milk to a dairy. They divided our group. One part was sent to mow the grass for the winter, and the part which I was in was sent to build the cow sheds. I was lucky that I was sent to build the cow sheds, because I got to work with the Russians, who had experience in this and knew how to build them. I didn't know carpentry. I was just 14 years old. So I was their assistant, bringing things to them, helping them, and telling them stories. They were listening and working. Anyway, I earned maybe 150 rubles during my first month. Something like that. It seemed to be a lot in those conditions, but you couldn't buy anything with that money. All the people there had small fields or gardens. They had a cow or domestic animals. There was a lot of honey there. 
A bucket of honey cost a few rubles. Why? We were so surprised. Why is there so much honey? It turned out that they all had beehives, because beehives had not been nationalized by the government, so farmers were allowed to have them. They were their property. So there was plenty of honey. It was possible to buy milk, but potatoes? It was almost impossible to get them. A bucket of potatoes cost an enormous amount of money, maybe 50 rubles. They taught us how to peel them so you could save the eye of the potato for the next year's crop. From time to time, it was possible to buy groats. My colleagues who worked mowing the grass told me that sometimes they cooked the groats and ate them together. They also slept together in a shed called a balagan. They went to sleep at sunset and started to work at sunrise, mowing the grass. The grass was so tall. When one rode a horse into this grass, it was so tall that it was like riding into a tunnel of sorts. Tall, tall, tall grass. From far off we could see the Altay Mountains, covered with snow. In August, the Russian political police came and told us that we were free Polish citizens and asked us where we would like to go. I chose the closest train station, Bilsk. It was such a long distance. How to get there? How to get to Bilsk? 